on, Jimmy. <laughs> You're gonna fight against when this balloon of yours goes up. Forces of anarchy, wreckers of law and order. See? Communists, Maoists. Trotskyists, neo-Trotskyists, crypto-Trotskyists, union leaders, communist union leaders. See? Atheists, agnostics, long-haired weirdos, short-haired weirdos, vandals, hooligans. The government hug the government love. The government hug the government love. The government hug the government love. Hi, Philip. Uh, thanks for being with us today. You're going to talk to us about the mind. Um, now, you're, uh, you've are you recently moved from Hungary and you're just uh-huh. taken up a position in University of Durham, is that right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, I've been, uh, been here for four years in Central European University in Budapest and um, just about to officially start at Durham. So, yeah, I've been, I've been teaching for about 11 years and I keep moving around. I've been in Liverpool, Birmingham, uh, Australia, Hertfordshire, about Budapest, and I'm, yeah, I'm hoping in Durham I'm gonna stay still for a while. <laughs> try, to, try, try to lay down some roots. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's the plan. Um, okay, so I <laughs> guess, so um, I guess rather than maybe asking you, you know, about sort of your background and stuff like that, I was just thinking maybe a way into that would be asking you, what is it that fascinates you about the mind and consciousness? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I think in general, I mean, I've always been interested in things that don't seem to fit into our scientific worldview. So, you know, I mean, consciousness would be an obvious one, but I mean, I think there are other examples, think like value, for example. You know, we tend to think there are facts about, about value, for example, that, you know, I don't know, torturing children is bad or creativity is good. And yet it's hard, it's hard to see how the, a phenomenon like value fits in with the kind of phenomena studied by the natural science, for example. Or another example is abstract objects. So, you know, mathematicians tell us all sort of cool things about numbers and sets, but you don't seem to find these things in the physical world, right? No matter how powerful your microscope or your telescope is, you're not going to come across the number nine or, or a set. So it's hard to see how, you know, the talk of numbers and sets fits in with talk of physical objects. So I guess I'm just kind of interested, I suppose, in how everything hangs together. All these different aspects of our worldview can fit together in in a single unified conception of reality. But I think consciousness is the most fascinating because I think it's the one thing we know for certain to exist. So some people, some, some philosophers deny the existence of value. Maybe, you know, there aren't really such facts as, as facts about value or deny the existence of abstract objects. But consciousness, you know, it seems like that there's nothing more evident than the reality of our feelings and experiences. And yet at the same time, it's, it's notoriously hard to fit into our scientific picture of the world. So it has to fit somehow because it's real. We know it's real. But it's just so hard to fit it in. So I think that's why it's just just such an interesting challenge. And I, yeah, I suppose the other thing is I've always been um, disappointed by by the standard views on this, and um, that's what's kind of deepened my puzzlement about it. Okay, so I mean, I think, and probably what we can do is we could probably go through some of the more conventional views and then move to the position that 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 you. Um, that you that you expound, which uh-huh. is uh, pan pan physicism. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, panpsychism. 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 Pan That's all right. Uh, panpsychism. Okay, which makes more a lot more sense. <laughs> uh, um, okay. Yes. Yeah, so um, now I'm going to ask a follow up question to what you were saying before. That's really fascinating. If I asked you a sort of a rhetorical question, does consciousness have to be restricted to something that goes on inside our skull? Well, I guess that would be the standard assumption, a kind of common sense dogma that um, consciousness is is something confined to the biological realm, human beings or or, or other animals. Um, but it's difficult when you really reflect to you know what what exactly justifies that common sense assumption. I mean, what one tricky thing about consciousness, which is uh, one of the reasons the science of consciousness is so tricky, is that it's it's unobservable, strictly speaking. You know, you can't look inside right. my head and see my feelings and experiences. You know, similarly, you can't look inside other objects to see if they do or they don't have consciousness. So that's that's one what one one tricky thing about it. And so. Um, 
there's nothing to rule out the possibility that things we don't normally think have consciousness might have. But of course, you'd need some reason to believe that, right? You'd need some reason for for uh, supposing that that was the case. Yeah, but I don't think there's any there's any in principle reason to think that consciousness can't be more widespread than we ordinarily take it to be. Okay, so uh, the the word I mean that's an interesting place to start. You say that consciousness is unobservable, and I and correct me if I'm wrong, but for you, I think uh, you're working between the sort of cleave between uh, third person naturalism or an objective view which is comes from the modern sciences and true mm-hmm. empiricism. And uh, I guess you're looking, trying to understand what it is like to be a consciousness, which is really yeah. difficult if it's unobservable. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, I mean, it flies in the face of, um, yeah. of naturalism. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose that, I mean, the, mo- most people accept that there is, a, that consciousness is a reality, quite sensibly. There are some... Radical philosophers who say it's a complete illusion, but most people like, accept its, um, its, its reality, but they want to try and somehow, as you say, fit it into our standard scientific picture of, of, of the universe. And, and the, 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 the standard way of doing that would be some form of materialism. You I know, mean, roughly that consciousness can be explained in terms of the, the chemistry of the brain. Now, you know, it's, 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 it's generally agreed that we don't have even the beginnings of, of, a, of an account of how brains produce consciousness. This is the so-called hard problem of consciousness. And that, you know, that is now a problem that's, that's taken very seriously indeed, largely thanks to the philosopher David Chalmers. So that's a problem that's taken very seriously. But still, a lot of, a lot of people, a common reaction is to say, okay, there's a real problem here, but you know, if we look at the great success of physical science in explaining more and more of, of the universe we live in, then this ought to give us confidence that if we just plug away at the standard neuroscientific methods of investigating the brain, you know, we'll one day crack the crack the problem of consciousness. Um, so, so it's taken seriously, but it's thought, you know, we just need to carry on and we'll get there. But I mean, that w- what I try to press is is um, the philosophical difficulties underlying the problem of consciousness and the fact that the problem of consciousness is radically unlike any of the other challenges physical science has faced. So, that, I mean, that's what I'm, what, what I'm trying to press really. Um, you know, in, in a broader audience, I think, I think the, the, the influence of David Chalmers in the 1990s was to get people to take the problem of consciousness seriously. You know, it used to be a sort of taboo subject that you, you know, you couldn't do serious science if you're into consciousness. Now people take it seriously, but I think there's still not a broad awareness of the philosophical underpinnings of the problem of consciousness. And so that's why people think, oh, let's just do more neuroscience. But I think once, once you have a more of a grip of the philosophical underpinnings of the problem of consciousness, uh, that, then you, you realize, you know, that's really not going to cut it and we need to sort of look for alternative paradigms a lot of what you say there immediately to me sounds like dualism but i don't think that's what Mm -hmm. you're actually saying so i mean so dualism is you know sort of philosophy of mind 101 dualism roughly begins with descartes where he says uh, i think therefore i am and uh he comes up with two the the mind and the matter are two separate substances right so that that kind of sounds like what you're saying that the material world which science studies and the mind, the, 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 sorry, I guess the, the conscious mm-hmm. world is what the psychology philosophy studies. And yeah. you're saying that they're not reconcilable. I don't think that's quite what you're saying, but I'm wondering where you yeah. position yourself in regard to dualism. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. You know, when I was a philosophy undergraduate, we were taught that they were the two options. Either you think physical science can explain consciousness, in which case you're a materialist. Or you think physical science can't explain consciousness, in which case you're a dualist. You think, as you say, that consciousness is something outside of the physical body and brain. Um, but, you know, I, unfortunately, I've always thought both of these views are hopeless, and, uh, which, which huh. got me stuck for a long time. So I think, I mean, I think the problem with dualism is, is an empirical one. I mean, I think we now do have overwhelming, um, 
you know, scientific support for the thesis that consciousness is, is in the brain rather than the soul. And um, I mean, I think the way to see this is just to think about, you know, what would what would what would be the case if dualism were true? So, you know, dualists think the mind is different to the body, but they but they also tend to think there's a close causal relationship. You know, the soul mm. sort of puppets the body or 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 maybe it pilots it like like a pilot of a drone or something. So, mm. you know, the the um, you know, the soul the soul's decisions cause the limbs to move, you know, the soul's thoughts cause the lips to move, to express your thoughts with your words. Um, so there's a close causal relationship. Now, you know, I think if there were an immaterial soul impacting on the brain, you know, every second of waking life, I think that would really show up in our neuroscience. You know, there'd be all sorts of things happening in the brain that had no physical explanation. It'd be like a poltergeist was playing with the brain. You know, that would really show up. And the fact <laughs> that it doesn't, you know, I think is a, is a, a strong and ever growing case that dualism is false and that consciousness is in the brain. So, so, so yeah, so I, so, so this is the, this is the puzzle. This is the paradox that, um, that I, you know, I think there's strong philosophical problems with materialism, which, which we haven't quite got onto it, could maybe say at some point. I think there are strong philosophical problems with dualism, there's strong scientific problems with dualism. And so, you know, both the standard options uh, seem inadequate. And so, yeah, for a long time, I just wanted to give up philosophy. I just thought, <laughs> well, this is just useless. I actually wrote my undergraduate dissertation on, you know, how the, the problem of consciousness is irresolvable. And, and I just went off and did something else for a bit. But uh, so, so, so this is, yeah, this uh, is David the, Hume, the yeah. <laughs> yeah so yeah, no way, yeah yeah so the um okay so i mean i think we had uh we had raymond Tallis on the podcast a couple of weeks ago oh yeah um, the way he the way he kind of defined it and i'd be interested to see what your take on it would be is uh -huh. he said that you know that the brain the material brain is a necessary but not sufficient condition so it's it's necessary in that it has to be there you have to have a brain for consciousness but it is not <laughs> enough there has to be additional components or agency or qualities yeah. or characteristics right so i'm wondering how how would you fit how would you respond to that uh yes and no i mean maybe just out with you know how i am how i would think about the the, the problems with materialism mm. you know i think to my mind that the core of the difficulty is that physical science works with a purely quantitative vocabulary uh whereas Consciousness is an essentially qualitative phenomenon, oh, right. just, just, just in the sense that it involves qualities. You know, if you think about the redness of a red experience or mm. the taste of chocolate or the smell of coffee. Emotions, you know, they, yeah. Yeah, they, 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 they all have this qualitative character. And I'd, I just think you can't capture that kind of quality, those kind of qualities in the, in the, in the quality, in the quantitative language of physical science. And in fact, this was well understood by the founder of physical science, Galileo, who, you know, Galileo only ever intended physical science to be a partial description of reality. You know, he hoped that it could capture the mathematical features of reality, but he never dreamt that it could capture, you could describe the qualities of consciousness in the purely quantitative language of physical science. So he took those qualities to be in the soul, you know, outside. So, so, I mean, and I actually argue in my book, that, you know, the reason physical science has been so successful is because, you know, Galileo kicks things off by taking consciousness out of the picture, now out of the domain of physical science and, and thereby giving physical scientists a more narrow domain of inquiry. Uh, and so, you know, when people say, oh, look at the success of physical science, you know, that shows that it's one day going to explain consciousness. You know, my response is, well, the physical science has been so successful precisely because it was never designed to um to deal with consciousness so you know and that's got that that's gone really well that kind of narrow narrow project but i think you know if 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 we want to um if we do want to believe in consciousness if we don't want to deny its existence we have to bring it somehow bring it back in somehow marry together um the quantitative information you get from physical science and the qualitative reality of consciousness that that we know about from our first person perspective, we have to find a, a philosophical worldview that, that marries them both together. Um, I guess, I guess, uh, I mean, I guess that's broadly similar to what, to what Raymond thinks. Um, 
Although I guess I guess he thinks we, we haven't yet got a framework for doing that, whereas I kind of think we have at least at least in broad brushstrokes. Okay, and that's what you yeah. call pan pan psychism. That's okay. Yes, I got a yeah, I got a real um, a problem with P's and C's, <laughs> yeah, which is odd given my name. It's really, uh, but um, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's okay. fine. Yeah. Okay. So um, okay. So maybe um. So you've talked about dualism there and you've talked about um, materialism, I think, and trying mm-hmm. to bring these two things together. And you're heading towards panpsychism. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, though, in the, in, the, in the interim, would it be interesting to talk about that movement in um, philosophy of mind called the Mysterians, the new Mysterians? Uh-huh. So, uh-huh. so I'm thinking here of people like uh, uh, Colin McGinn, I guess, who uh-huh. uh-huh. kind of comes at consciousness from a sure. Wittgensteinian position, I think, where he sort of says... He, or he puts consciousness as one of the pro- insoluble problems that that we don't actually have the capacity to to solve it in a satisfactory way, right? So I'm wondering where you position yourself in relation to that. Is this yeah. f- for you false dichotomy between uh, mind and matter, or is that dualism and materialism? Is that uh, is that something that the mis- uh, that the mysterians uh-huh. is that? Is, is that Sorry, I, let, me, let me rephrase that. Is that a, is that something insoluble? I think um, I guess you can, depends how you define the mysterious position. I think I think Colin McGinn's views is slightly different to a Wittgensteinian view. I mean, so a Wittgensteinian would say that there's some something confused about the problem of consciousness. You know, that the whole the whole this whole philosophical problem, the hard problem of consciousness, is somehow the result of philosophical confusion. And all you have to do is sort of unravel the philosophical confusion and get back to ordinary life and ordinary science, and then and then you're done with it. Whereas, I mean, I think Colin McGinn's position is is it's it's a perfectly coherent question, it's a perfectly coherent problem, but human beings are just incapable of solving it. And, you know, it's something like the way kind of dogs can't do mathematics. You know, we just we uh you know maybe our brains aren't big enough, or more likely. There are just the, the features of reality that explain consciousness are somehow inaccessible to us. That's not and unreasonable. That, that's not an unreasonable yeah, position. Yeah. Look, I mean, I've got I've got a lot of time for that that position because you know if you if you think we we are creatures that evolved through natural selection, evolved to survive, then you know it, it might not seem it might seem not unlikely that there could be features of reality that we can't quite get at. I mean, you might think it's surprising if, if we, if we, if we could get at the complete nature of reality, given that we've evolved to survive rather than to do science. Um, so, you know, I'm not unsympathetic to that view, but, um, I suppose, why would you go for mystery when, when there is an alternative, when there is, in my view, a perfectly intelligible theory that, that, does the job. I mean, at least it has the potential to do the job. I don't think anyone's got a complete theory of consciousness, but the panpsychist approach seems to me, um, a, a view with the potential to avoid mystery and to give us a completely intelligible account of consciousness. Um, I, I mean, actually Colin McGinn's written on, on, on panpsychism in, in a volume on the panpsychism of Galen Strawson. And, um, I mean, he mostly just sort of says, oh, it's kind of, hippie nonsense. You know. yeah, so there are, I mean, there are these unfortunate cultural associations, but, you know, I think you should judge a view by its, not by its cultural associations, by its explanatory power. You know, if we, and the, the attraction of panpsychism, in my view, is that it provides a way of integrating consciousness into our scientific picture of the world that avoids the deep problems of physicalism on the one hand, materialism on the one hand, and dualism on the other. And, you know, if, if there is a view with such, with such possibilities, you know, why take some kind of unfortunate cultural connotations as a kind of deterrent? Okay, let's, let's press on with that thought then. Um, panpsychism, right? Uh, in order to disentangle it from all those, uh, that, that hippie nonsense that McGinn is on about. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, the sort of you know the expansive nature of consciousness, which comes from taking LSD or whatever. The um, panpsychism is not say pantheism, right? It's not you. you there are two different things. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think that way so, you use is that sorry, excuse me, is that a useful distinction? Yeah. No, I think it is. Well, maybe you just start with. I mean, the way I define panpsychism 
be the view that consciousness is a fundamental and ubiquitous feature of the physical world. So on, on a standard version of panpsychism, the basic constituents of the physical world, perhaps electrons and quarks, have unimaginably, not incredibly simple forms of conscious experience, and that the conscious experience of a human or animal brain is constituted of the consciousness of its most basic parts. Um, so, so you know, sounds a bit crazy, sounds a bit, you know, it, it still has these, even when it's described correctly, and, you know, I'll distinguish it from pantheism in a moment, but even when it's described correctly, it still does have these unfortunate connotations. But as I say, I mean, the, the, the attraction of it is that it's, um, it offers us, we need to fit conscious, we know consciousness exists, it has to fit in somehow, and this is a proposal that manages to do it or gives that has the potential to do it whilst avoiding the deep difficulties with, with the other options. So, so I think it's you know a case can be built for it as it's a sort of inference to the best explanation, the the best account of how consciousness fits into reality. But anyway, to come to your question, so how is that different from pantheism? So I guess pantheism is the view that God and the physical world are identical or so instead of a, a supernatural idea of God that's perhaps more familiar where God is outside of space and time, for the pantheist, God infuses space and time or is identical with the universe or something. So I think panpsychism is very different to that because – so the idea is that perhaps electrons and quite fundamental particles have incredibly simple experience – but they don't have any kind of godlike characteristics. You know, they don't have thought or reason or intelligence. It's not like our spirit. You know, maybe it depends what you mean by spirit. I mean, I guess most contemporary panpsychists wouldn't tend to use the word spirit. Although Eddington, who's a very important influence here, tended to use the word spirit. But I guess he just meant something synonymous with mental. So if you just use it in that sense, then. But yeah, it's nothing spiritual or. This is this is a cold-blooded scientific proposal as the best account of consciousness. Consciousness being a phenomenon, a natural phenomenon that we know exists. You know, we know consciousness exists as much as electromagnetism exists. We have to account for it in our scientific theory of the world. So, so this is a, a cold-blooded naturalistic proposal. It's not anything religious or spiritual. You know, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean, you know, sometimes the view sometimes caricatured thinking that kind of electrons have existential angst or something or there, you know, the, yeah. it's, it, it's just that, you know, if you imagine, I sometimes put it like this, imagine, you know, human consciousness is very complex. The consciousness of a horse, less so, a mouse, less so again, you know, and if you keep going down to simpler and simpler forms of organic life, you know, maybe at some point the light of consciousness just switches off. Or maybe the panpsychist poser it just keeps going in simpler and simpler forms of experience until we get down to the very basic components of the material world. So, mm. yeah. Sounds very medieval, that. Very medieval hierarchy. Yeah. Well, without the angels, I guess, but yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's, so it's just it's, an observation. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. I mean, well, in a way, it's, it's, it's very structurally similar to materialism. You know, a materialist will think... Mm would think there's the, you know, complex physical things are made up of simpler physical things. And so they would have that. They So structurally, it's actually very similar to materialism. And I think that's one of the advantages that it it has all the advantages of materialism uh, and uh, in terms of fitting with our scientific picture of the world. But um, but but, you know, what, what, what the panpsychists would add is that um, the basic simple constituents of the physical world have this conscious nature that's the uh, and that is postulated in order to in order to explain consciousness what does the scientist think of all this are, are they receptive to these ideas is like is a, is a working day psychologist interested in pan uh, psychism well <laughs> um i mean just in academic philosophy you know when i was doing my phd like I finished my PhD 12 years ago, you know, looking for academic jobs, and I was told um, not, you know, to keep it a secret <laughs> because it's 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 gonna, you know, it's by people who are sympathetic to me, you know. Oh, Phil's uh, dark little secret. <laughs> yeah, but it's you know, but I, it, I'm loud and proud now. You know, the last five <laughs> years, it is really getting taken in academic philosophy. It is, you know, 
a minority, but a, a well-respected view, partly due to this, uh, which we might be good to talk about, the rediscovery of, of certain views of Russell and Bertrand Russell and Eddington from the 1920s. But anyway, maybe. but, um, it, you know, it, it really is getting taken more seriously as um, in academic philosophy. Um, and also, I mean, also one of the leading uh, neuroscientific theories of consciousness, the, the integrated information theory of consciousness by um, Julian Tononi, which is, you know, is one of the most empirically supported neuroscientific theories of consciousness. And that it also has panpsychist implications, it, it just at least in the sense that it implies that consciousness is more widespread uh, than we ordinarily take it to be. So, so for that reason, also, I think um, panpsychism is, is, is getting taken more seriously. But, you know, it's early days, and I, I will admit it still does. People, do, philosophers and scientists still do sometimes, you know, just think, oh, this is ridiculous, this is an embarrassment. And, but, you know, it, it, it's early days in a, in a new scientific paradigm. And, um, I mean, this is partly, I mean, I published my first academic book last year, and what I'm trying to do now is, uh, publish a lot more popular stuff and um sure. I'm working on a book aimed at a general audience that it's going to call Galileo's error that's going to come out next year and so what I want to try and do is, is get these revolutionary ideas of Russell and Eddington out into the broader scientific community out into the general public um you know I I I really think these guys did in the 1920s for consciousness science, what Darwin did for the science of life. Wow, but, that's a that's a know, big claim. That's a big claim. Could you could you maybe uh, expand on that? Like, uh, why why uh, uh, or what do you take from Russell and Eddington? That's yeah. Um, okay, so their so, 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 so their starting point really is um, this is I mean the philosopher Bertrand Russell and um, and the scientist Arthur Eddington is incidentally the first scientist to confirm general relativity. Um, in between the wars, but um, and there was wonderful interaction then between philosophers and physicists that is maybe a bit more lacking today. But anyway, um, their starting point is that physical science tells you a lot less than you think about the nature of matter. Um, so, you know, in the public mind, physical science is on its way to giving us this complete account of the nature of space and time and matter. You know, we're not quite there yet. But, you know, we just need to iron out some wrinkles and eventually it's going to get there. But what 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 Eddington and Russell realized is that actually when you reflect, I mean, you know, and Eddington was a physicist himself. When you reflect upon what physical science tells you about the world, you discover that it's it's just confined to what matter does. Right. It's behavior. Um, so if you think about what what physics tells us about an electron, physics tells us an electron has mass and charge, for example, you know, how are these properties characterized? Mass is characterized in terms of gravitational attraction and resistance to acceleration. You know, these all concern what the electron does. Um, or charge, negative charge is characterized in terms of repel repelling uh, positive charge, sorry, attraction to positive charge and repulsion to other things in negative charge. Again, this is the behavior. Physical science tells you nothing about what philosophers like to call the intrinsic nature of the electron, you know, how the electron is in and of itself. So, so what you don't realize is that this huge hole in our scientific picture of the universe, right? Physical science tells us nothing about the intrinsic nature of matter. So sometimes called the problem of intrinsic natures. Um, and then I think, I think the genius of, of Russell and, and Eddington was to relate this to the problem of consciousness, right? So you can think of the problem of consciousness as how do we how do we find a place for consciousness? How do we fit consciousness into our scientific picture? And then the problem of intrinsic natures is there's this huge hole in our scientific picture. So Eddington thought, well, let's put consciousness in the hole, right? <laughs> you know, we've got this. We've found a place for consciousness. We've got this hole. Put it in the hole. So roughly, the, roughly the picture is. There's just matter, right? No dualism. That's empirically implausible. There's just matter. But physical science tells you what it does. It describes it, as it were, from the outside. It tells you about its behavior, wonderful information about its behavior, you know, that allows you to manipulate it and produce extraordinary technology. But in its intrinsic nature, the intrinsic nature of matter is constituted by forms of consciousness, 
So this is a wonderful, simple, parsimonious, uh, unified way of integrating consciousness into our scientific picture of physical reality. You know, it, it doesn't interfere with anything we know about scientifically, but it, we know consciousness exists. We need a place for it. It provides a place for it. So, so it's, so, you know, it's, it's really has all the, all the advantages of materialism, you know, without any of the problems. And, um, so, so it's, you know, it's, it's more a broad framework than a complete theory. Um, and I think if we're going to ever fill in the details, I think it kind of got forgotten about with the, you know, this is in the 1920s and then you had the, the Great Depression and the Second World War and the sort of anti-philosophy zeitgeist of the latter, the post-war years. Uh, and it's only recently been rediscovered in the last kind of 10 years, perhaps. Um, but it's caused a hell of a lot of excitement in academic philosophy. You know, part of what my book does is bring together a lot of the recent literature on this. So what I really want to do is get the, the essence of this position out to scientists, the general public. So, you know, we can start built, filling in the details and, you know, start genuinely doing a, a, a proper science of consciousness rather than kind of pretending it doesn't exist. OK, so uh, and that book is called uh, Consciousness and Fundamental Reality. Yeah, my uh, academic book. Yeah, your that's, academic book. Sorry, yeah. yeah, yeah and sure. I should and I should point out that it's it's really well written and uh, you do a really good job on that and which oh, is um, so. which is uh, <laughs> well, good writing is not known to academics basically. Thanks a so, lot. so you're an exception to that. Uh, well, I'm uh, trying. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying in this new book to be even. Or, you know, philosophers don't do this enough to write for a general audience, and so I'm trying in my new book to even more to just an incredibly you know more very accessible sort of stories and um yeah anyway sorry yeah. I interrupted you. no no not at all um uh, yeah so let's talk your, your book is called consciousness and fundamental reality and that mm -hmm. is basically i guess your articulation of the things you've been talking about how you've come out of eddie and russell and uh, yeah. in it you're um in the opening pages, you talk about a rejection of, I think, a really evocative phrase, neurofundamentalism. So oh, what yeah. I'm thinking about is how can we talk about panpsychism as, or what does panpsychism tell us about consciousness as a reject, and as, if we are rejecting what you call neurofundamentalism? Uh huh. Yeah. So, um, I don't think panpsychism tells us anything about consciousness. I mean, this is another thing that the problem of consciousness is, is often put in the following way. People often say, we don't know what consciousness is. Consciousness is a mystery. We don't know what it is. I don't think that's true at all. I think we, everyone knows completely well what consciousness is. You know, you know what pain is by feeling pain. You know what red experiences are by having red experiences. Um, which is not to say you're sort of infallible, but you, I think there are really interesting cases where people make mistakes. But, you know, in, broadly, you know what consciousness is. The problem is not what it is, but how, you know, how it fits in. There doesn't seem to be a place for it in, in our scientific story. Um, so, so neurofundamentalism, so it's, that's what panpsychism is trying to do. It's not trying to tell us anything new about consciousness. It's, it's, it give, it's giving us a place for consciousness without interfering with. So, you know, dualism gives us a place for consciousness, but the problem is it's scientifically implausible. So panpsychism gives us a scientifically plausible place for consciousness. Um, but neurofundamentalism, uh, it's a long time since I've read <laughs> my own book, uh, is, is just a position, I, I guess, that I was articulating that um, to solve the problem of consciousness, you, you just need to do more neuroscience, um, you know, and, and we'll one day crack it. But, so it's um, kind of a, an anti-Churchland's position? Yeah, absolutely. Patricia Churchland is, yeah, I guess, the... the um, lead one of the lead figures on this people like Anil Seth who's been really interesting neuroscience you know uh, really interested in his work but I guess again um, I, I suppose that the, I mean I have I, I, I have terms I absolutely love neuroscience and neuroscience is crucial for making progress on science but I suppose that what I think neuroscience gives you is correlations so you know neuroscience can tell us um, you know, when people have certain things going on in their brain. They have certain kinds of experience and, uh, or vice versa. So you can tell us, you know, which, which conscious experiences are correlated with which brain states, which happenings in the brain. But, but then, but then we need an explanation. Well, why is that? What, you know, so that's, that, that, that's the start of the problem. That's not, that doesn't give us a solution. 
We know, why do those correlations hold? Why is it when, you know, C5 is a firing in your brain, you feel pain or whatever, to use the empirically implausible example philosophers always give, actually. But anyway, um, you know, why do these correlations obtain? And, and just doing your neuroscience is, is, is not is not going to it's not going to give you a solution there, I think. OK, so um, I'm trying to wonder, are, uh, Din, are, are you doing when you say fundamental reality, you're trying to overcome the, 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 the sort of the, the limitations of dualism and materialism? Are you mm -hmm. doing ontology? So, you know, yeah, by, by talking about the nature of reality or trying to come up with a theory absolutely. of reality? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I'm, I have a final chapter, the final chapter of my academic book, Consciousness of Fundamental Reality, is actually all, all about this question of how should we do ontology, right? How, I, I mean, it's a really interesting history. I think, af, you know, after the war, the days of logical positivism, People thought metaphysics and ontology was a was a confused load of nonsense. You know, how can you how can you find sure. out about reality just sat in an armchair? Um, and then slowly from the 1970s, people started doing it again. And now in in philosophy departments all over the place, you know, people do metaphysics and they 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 find out about reality. But I think I think a lot of people, a lot of the general public, have no idea this is going on. And maybe it's good because maybe they wouldn't like the taxpayer spending but but um you know uh, but then how are we it, it is a good question how are we supposed to do this right how are you supposed to find out about the world without doing experiments or observing i think you know i think most people in the public would be mystified by that idea uh and i propose an, an answer to that there's that there's one thing we know about reality um not from observation experiments, and that is consciousness, right? We know consciousness is real. Uh, so e e even so suppose one day we we get the grand unified theory of, from physicists that can that can e explain all of the data of observation and experiments. That wouldn't be a complete theory of reality because it, it might not account for consciousness. So consciousness I take to be a datum in its own right. We know it exists, and so it has to be accounted for, just like the data of observation experiments have to be accounted for. So I suppose I'm, I'm, that would be my proposal for how we do ontology. We take science, we take what we know scientifically, we take the reality of consciousness that is the thing most certain to us, we all know that consciousness exists, and we try to find out the simplest, um, most you know, parsimonious, unified theory of reality that can account for both. And I think we haven't started doing that yet. So, you know, we, 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 we need to at some point start doing that. And if, you know, maybe in a couple of hundred years, we could achieve consensus on these matters. So, yeah, that's, that it, yeah, it's my proposal for how we should do ontology. So, okay. So, um, then, and, you know, uh, when we, when we, at the outset of our conversation, you talked about this tension between the qualitative and the quantitative. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess between introspection and sort of third person perspectives, you know, sort of the view from nowhere, as Nagel might put it. What, yeah. what, what, uh, how, uh, what, how is panpsychism resolving that for you? Because so that, yeah, that's exactly the right way to put it, right? There are two things we need to bring together. The third person perspective that you get from physical science and the first person perspective that we know just by being conscious, you know. Um, the proposal, and, and the proposal is really the core of this Russell Eddington proposal that consciousness is the intrinsic nature of the brain. The first person perspective is the intrinsic nature of the brain. So, you know, what brain science tells you, what neuroscience tells you is, is what the brain does or what its parts do. You know, neuroscience will tell you what, you know, what the cerebellum does, how it, you know, contributes, how different bits of the brain contribute to integrating information and production of behavior and sensory inputs, what the brain does. But in its intrinsic nature, the brain is constituted of consciousness, forms of consciousness. The intrinsic nature of the brain is constituted of forms of consciousness. So... So the first person perspective is, is the intrinsic nature, whereas the third person perspective is what the what, what things do, what the brain does. So that's a way of br trying to bring them both together in a single unified 
picture of, of, of the of the material world. That's that's the idea. So yeah, sorry. Um, how does what? Okay, so then I'll ask you sort of a very naive question. Then mm-hmm. um, how how does consciousness happen? You know, say if you yeah. take me, I'm I'm a sensate being. I'm a organic being. I'm made up of all of these different things. A stone, on the other hand, is a different yeah. type of uh, being. As maybe you might argue, is a, a diminished form of uh, sensibility. How for you does I guess human consciousness then at least emerge? Within the your broader framework of panpsychism, yeah, yeah, good. It's good, excellent question. So, um, um, just I mean, on the question of the stone, actually, it's I mean, it's common misconception. Panpsychism needn't imply stones are conscious, right? It, it, mm, it doesn't. Right, Im- right, right. It doesn't imply that everything is conscious. It implies the view is that the fundamental constituents of reality are conscious, but it might not be that every arrangement of those is conscious. So it could be that a stone is not itself conscious, even though it's ultimately made up of things that are conscious. But this is, but this is a crucial, but coming to the question you asked, I mean, it's a crucial question. Okay. And some people make the following objection to panpsychism. You know, okay, you've got these little conscious things, but, but how do they come together to make the con- the consciousness of the human brain? How do little conscious things come together to make a big conscious thing? So this has become known as the combination problem. Mm. Uh, and, and this is, this is the most important challenge to the panpsychist worldview. And I would say most panpsychists would agree there isn't yet a, a perfectly satisfying solution to this. In fact, the, um, y- you know, the, the, the the core activity of the panpsychist work, uh, research proposal is, is trying to address this. And there are all, already all sorts of, you know, really interesting proposals. There are people talking about integration of information. There are people thinking about wh- whether this could be conceived as an aspect of the more general problem of the unity of consciousness. There are people rethinking um, sp- the nature of spatial relationships. Maybe that's part of what's, what, what's getting in the way here. Um, I, I just read a really cool paper that's just come out thinking wh- wh- whether this combination problem might result from our first order predicate logic that we're thinking it's we're thinking in the wrong logic, um, wh- whereas we should be. Th- uh, so th- there's so, so so look, nobody has a complete th- theory of consciousness. Well, you know what we want to explain ultimately. You're completely right. Is human and animal consciousness? That's the thing we know exists. That's the datum. That's what we need to explain. Nobody has got a complete theory of that, but it just seems to me, I suppose, that the 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 problems that the panpsychist face faces are more tractable than the problems the materialist or the dualist faces. So you know, it's a research program. It's a, it's a work in progress. It, and it, it's gonna. If we're gonna make progress, it's gonna involve neuroscience, perhaps physics. Um, so, so yeah, we're, we're we're not there yet. We're not all the way up to human consciousness. So it, it's it's a framework. It's a framework for uh, for making progress. That's the okay. So, do you think it's got a value or sort of? I suppose I guess to use your your phrase, explanatory power for some of the you know. The, you know some of the, the, the first person things we associate with consciousness like so for example can pan uh, psychism <laughs> tell us something uh-huh. about say the nature of uh, the will or the nature of uh-huh. agency uh-huh. Is, like say if you have is if, if you talk about the will is that something you know not in a dualistic sense but is that something that's, that's separate from you know our in the involuntary uh, our involuntary reactions our instinctual reactions um yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, or does it have application? I guess Phil is what I'm saying. You know, for for those are, I and it's something I really need to think more about. Actually, I'm not sure panpsychism does help us with questions of agency or questions of free will, and that's precisely because it, it is structurally uh, very similar to materialism. So, you know, the, the panpsychist or the kind of panpsychist, this Eddie, Russell Eddington sort of panpsychism, um, you know, it's, it is the idea that there's just matter, you know, obeying, you know, behaving as physical science tells us it does, but it has this intrinsic nature and constitutive consciousness. Um, but, but in terms of its behavioral properties, you know, it, it, it's just as, you know, we look to science to tell us those. So, um, 
So you might have all the same kind of concerns with free will that a standard materialist might have, in fact. Um, personally, I, I've never been that persuaded by either the philosophical or, or the scientific arguments against the reality of free will. So I'm a sort of tentative believer in free will of a probably a rather strong libertarian form. Um, but I'm not sure that's necessarily connected to panpsychism. I, I mean, I guess it, it might help in the sense that the panpsychist allows you to accept the reality of your consciousness as you ordinarily take it to be. Uh, and that's going to include the experience of agency. But, um, but as to those classic philosophical problems of how we, um, reconcile free human agency with Con, with uh, causation as as we as as we find it in, in physical sciences, I'm not sure panpsychism will help there. Yeah, I'm wondering. I'm interested because well, I come from a phenomenological phenomenological background, uh-huh. and I, th- I think of mm. I mean, sort of Husserl is sort of the uh, the foundational guy there, and he'll say yeah. that consciousness, all consciousness, is consciousness of something. All consciousness is intentional right. in the sense yeah. that it has an orientation towards um, uh, 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 reality. You know, so I think I, yeah. I, I, uh, I'm wondering if you see an overlap there or. Yeah, yeah, intention. Right. So. So I guess you're raising the the issue of what philosophers call, as you know, intentionality, um, I guess a more general term, which mental representation, things like thought, you know, thought, mental states that represent the world, like perceptual states or. Or thoughts about That's the world. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how yeah, do we sort I, of resolve the sorry confusing word intentionality? Because people just think it means to do with intentions or something. I That's mean, right, yeah. outside of philosophy. But, but yeah, yeah, no, it's a good question. So look, I, I think, I mean, I, I come from uh, an analytic philo- philosophical tradition, and I, I think people outside of philosophy are always quite surprised that I mean, there's still the, the dominant view in analytic philosophy is still that intentionality or mental representation has, so has or thought at least has nothing to do with consciousness right that these are two kind of completely different things if you thought, look at the, that's a that's a thought has nothing to do with consciousness yeah it's, it's crazy you know if you no, look it's at true the, yeah, yeah it's true that's what they say yeah if you look at the dominant theories of thought from the 20th century like uh donald davidson or jerry fodor they, they say nothing about consciousness they think it's just a so there was so there arose this i mean if you think of the 1990s that the view was you, there's this funny thing, consciousness, that we've got a problem with. But, you know, thought, intentionality, that's that's fine. We can naturalize that. We can just explain that physicalistically, behavioristically or something. Um, so so then, 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 you know, that would be a completely separate. So, so if a panpsychist were to take that standard analytic philosophy line, then they would say, uh, well, panpsychism doesn't have to doesn't tell you anything about intentionality, but that's fine. We can deal with that materialistically um but actually i'm one of the growing minority of analytic philosophers that completely go against this and i you know i think thought and mental representation just is a form of consciousness a, a highly evolved form of, of of human consciousness um and so i would as a panpsychist I, I would fit it in in exactly the same way that other forms of consciousness in um so that's, I mean, that, I guess that's another, another, that, that, that's another, another view that was once ridiculed and still is a little bit ridiculed, but over the course of my relatively short academic career has, has really become to dominate. And so it's, yeah, it's a really exciting time in analytic philosophy of mind that these views like, you know, you know are, are becoming taken more seriously and there's, there's a revolution, man. <laughs> I was so, about to say it sounds a lot like Deleuze, what you're talking about, but uh, I will, perhaps we won't go that far uh, just yet. Yeah, well, I, I, I do. Th- I'm, I'm, I'm. I have to confess, I'm not incredibly well read in the continental tradition, and I, I really need to um, read more phenomenology. But it, yeah, it always struck me that the phenomenologists have a much better, better grip on characterizing experience than analytic philosophers who always just talk about sort of pains and red and i mean like i have done today to be fair but uh you know the it's the beautiful kind of characteris- characterization of, of the first person perspective you get from Rousseau or something you know it's much more sort of closer to the truth i think yeah maybe 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 we're not so different after all um yeah the um i'm wondering uh i guess uh i guess 
one of the advantages, it strikes me at least, that one of the advantages of your, the theory of panpsychism that you're propounding, or sorry, expounding, is that, um, uh, that, that it, it solves the problem of solipsism. Uh, you know, I mean, there mm. cannot, it cannot be, uh, Solipsism is basically the idea that I am all that is the case. But if yeah. I am all that is the case, and that's what I was hinting at with phenomenology, is that uh-huh. what we take to be consciousness is indicative in some way of the material world, which thereby rejects the idea that I am the, the, the sole source of reality. That's really interesting. I'll have to, I'd have to think more about that. I've never thought. I, um, maybe it depends where you think the, the problem of solipsism is. I suppose if you're thinking of it, and maybe, you know, this can be understood in different ways. If you think of it as a sort of sceptical problem of like Descartes, or, you know, how do I know there's anything outside of my mind? I think the panpsychist faces that as much as anybody else. Cause you know, I have, I know for, with something close to certainty that my own consciousness exists, but I don't know. I don't know for certain any, any other forms of consciousness exist. You know, I accept panpsychism as, as the most plausible theory. Once you've, got empirical data once you're accepting there's an uh, an empirical world out there but um, you've already got to get there and i don't think accepting panpsychism helps you with with that old school skeptical problem or is it were you thinking of the problem of solipsism in a different way or no no, no i mean just in the sort of the uh, the, 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 the the conventional skeptical sense yeah you know, that is, yeah that is yeah. yeah um that was just a thought just a thought That's just a thought I'll, I'll think more yeah. about that now uh one other thing i'd like to ask you about is i mean you're someone who's i guess you know you've given a great deal of time uh, and effort and labor thinking about the nature of consciousness writing about the nature of consciousness i'm wondering um do you think panpsychism has would have would have would something to tell us about say the question of mental health for example now um i don't necessarily think that's the case but i mean would mental health i mean if we think of like say Descartes or something like that, the idea is you know Descartes gets attacked by these sort of demons of doubt, which is to sort mm. of to wade to wade away to yeah. to, wade, uh, to 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 fend off. So I mean, the idea that sort of I don't know that the 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 mind which is suffering from mental health problems is in some way fragmented or broken. Yeah. Is, is 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 that something that you have thought about, or is that something that pad, uh, psychism can uh, tell us something about? Yeah, I mean, it's something I'm starting to think about because, uh, so as I say, I sort of I defend panpsychism in the first instance as just you know a cold-blooded scientific theory. It's the best explanation of consciousness, and I suppose I go on about that because there are these cultural connotations that I want to. Uh, avoid or at least say I'm not necessarily bound up with the view but I, I have been thinking about for the final chapter of my um, book, book aimed at a general audience I'm currently working on and you know okay forget suppose panpsychism is true for, does it what, what implications if any does it have for human existence and uh, you know our, our lived lives and I don't know I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe it it, it does provide a picture of the universe in which human beings can feel a little bit more at home. I mean, I don't, like materialism is a pretty austere worldview. You know, you've got sort of a mechanistic nature and, uh, you know, the cold immensity of empty space. And, um, you know, I sometimes wonder whether this is in part a small part of why people turn to nationalism or consumerism or, you know, in the absence of a worldview in which the universe makes sense or, or in which you, you know, in the absence of an environment in which you feel a part of. Whereas I, I guess panpsychism, and this is not the reason I would think it's true, but I think it, it does provide a picture of the universe that's a bit more welcoming, that, you know, we're conscious beings in a conscious universe, in a natural world in, infused, uh, infused with consciousness. Um, you know, it provides a picture of the world in which we're a little bit more at home and, you know, maybe, maybe a worldview that might maybe make people a little bit less dependent on artificial, socially constructed, uh, environments like consumer culture or nationalism. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of wild speculation, but actually one thing I think it might help us with is our relationship to the environment. Um, Naomi Klein blames in part dualism, actually 
for, for our, our inability to handle the climate crisis thinks, you know, this kind of separation between us conscious beings and the rest of nature. Or, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're a materialist, hugging a tree is ridiculous, right? <laughs> Because it's a, it's a mechanism, right? Who would hug a mechanism? Yes, I, I, I agree with you. Hugging a Whereas, tree is uh, ridiculous. <laughs> if you're a materialist, if you're a materialist. But, you know, if you're a pants, I think your tree is, I believe that tree is, is, is a, you know, is, is a conscious organism. And so it's, you know, it's, it's not a million miles away from stroking a cat, although, you know, you don't quite get <laughs> the same reaction. But, you know, if people could, and, and you know, there's, there's, even forgetting what I've been talking about today, there's, I mean, there's so much, Hard scientific evidence now that, that, that plant mentality is so much richer than, you know, th- than we tend to think that, you know, um, plants are able to, to remember, to preferentially favor the, the, their genetic kin. Um, you know, trees are connected up under the ground by, by virtue of what's called mycorrhiza structures uh, and, and provide support and uh, exchange of, of, of nutrients and carbon amongst even amongst different species so you know people will grow up thinking of thinking of, of of the natural world as teeming with consciousness thinking of you know the forest as a, as, as a kind of in some sense a, a, a community uh, of uh, conscious beings um you know i mean i think this this might provide a picture of nature and a picture of the environment so if you coming back to the environmental crisis that is is we've just found out yesterday is even more pressing than we realized. You know, if you, if you think nature is lacking in consciousness, then, you know, really we're thinking of plants and trees just in terms of what they can do for us, you know, in terms of sustaining our existence or looking pretty or whatever. But, you know, if you think of a tree as a conscious organism, then it's, it's, it's an immediate focus of moral concern. And, um, so yeah, so in, in that sense, I think it, it provides a more a more healthier relationship with with nature and with the universe more generally. But you know, that's not why we should believe it to be true. <laughs> but yeah, so, <laughs> so I was, uh, that's that's why I asked you about the I guess pantheism uh, at the outset because I thought uh, 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 the idea that uh, th- I, was, I guess what you're saying is that pan uh, psychism does uh, give us an idea of consciousness as our human thought embedded in its broader environment i, I mean is this yeah. a type of a, so it's a type of a deep ecology is it that you're, um, that you're... perhaps yeah depending yeah, so so yeah i mean the reason i resist kind of pandemic is you've just got to be careful that how exactly this is being defined it's it's um you know it's not like nature has God-like characteristics. It's not like the it's not like the forest is is thinking, you know. Like it's not like the forest is. Like I don't. Lord I don't, of the Rings or something yeah, like that. I don't yeah. think trees are sitting there having conceptual thoughts and wondering what's going on and stuff. And it's you know they 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 they're, they're not that kind of organism. But um, but well, you know once it's qualified exactly the nature of the view, perhaps it gets cl- you know it provides a, a, a worldview that in some way. It has more to, fits better with our spiritual needs in some sense and um it, it's a picture of nature which we have a real we have a genuine kinship with nature um we're not sort of if you're a dualist you know we're sort of conscious beings kind of trapped in this mechanism for some reason it's a kind of really unnatural situation but um you know panpsychism offers a you know, picture of the world in which we've got a real kinship with the universe and can feel a little bit more at home I guess, yeah. I guess, I guess that's that's a good place to probably end it, actually. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Thanks, I think. Phil. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. It's um, been great chatting. Thank you for listening to the Well. Our theme tune is "Love the Government" by Alpaca Giraffe, and is licensed under Creative Commons. You can follow us on iTunes or your preferred podcast app. 